I want to thank you for inviting me to testify uh, today on the critical issue of crude oil exports. My name is Leo Gerard. I'm the international president of the Steelworkers Union. We have 850,000 members in our union and more than 30,000 working in the refining industry. While I will focus on the fact that the USWA represents workers in 63 refineries in the nation's ca uh, country, which amounts to two-thirds two-thirds of the domestic refining capacity. I also want to make the point that more than 10,000 of those workers have either signed a petition or written a letter urging the continuation of the crude export ban. I can't stress enough what this does. Although I talk about the 63 refineries, there's no doubt about it whatsoever that our industrial base would be affected by the removal of the export ban. The increase in the cost of energy for American manufacturers in almost every major sector of the economy, whether that's tire and rubber, whether that's paper, whether that's steel, they are energy dependent. And that the rise in the cost by us exporting our crude oil rather than refining it at home would not only affect our refineries, but also would affect our manufacturing base. In 2014, 27% of the petroleum consumed in the United States was imported from foreign countries. Our nation is not self-sufficient in oil, as 44% of the crude oil process in U.S. refineries is imported. Secretary Moniz, appearing before the House Energy and Power Subcommittee, pointed out that for every barrel of crude oil that we would export, we would have to import another barrel. The fact is that not all crude oil is the same. By keeping oil produced in the U.S. here at home for refining, refiners have been able to realign their processes to specialize in the types of crudes that are produced here. That allows for greater refining efficiency and increased production. For example, just in one year, American refineries, through streamlining their processes, have been able to increase production by 100,000 barrels a day. So that if we think about exporting our crude oil, what we're in fact doing is exporting the raw material. There's nothing wrong. This union is not opposed to exports. What we're ex opposed to is exporting the raw material that would allow other nations to refine that crude and then sell it back to us, which quite frankly doesn't make sense. We can keep the crude oil at home, realign our refineries, process it here, create raw, from raw material, create a new commodity, and either use that commodity at home to keep lower cost energy so that our manufacturers can have a competitive advantage, or we can sell it off short and let the Chinese get that competitive advantage, competitive advantage and then use their position to again undermine our industrial base in this country. Mr. Moncrief just said that there's insufficient refining capacity for light crude oil. Mr. Troy, I'd like to ask you about this, and this has resulted in a surplus of, of their product, if you will. It's my understanding that refineries are, in fact, investing in converting facilities to process an additional 720,000 barrels of, of light tight oil per day. Uh, speak, if you would, Mr. Gerard, to those investments going on at refineries around the country. Uh, right now, the uh, refineries around the country are, in fact, committing to investing somewhere between eight to nine billion dollars in both modernization and efficiency. Uh, that uh, additional investment will allow them over that period of time to be able to process an additional four million barrels uh, per day of value-added exports. The issue for us is not whether or not we should export. The issue is that we should be exporting finished products and we should be making those finished products in our refineries. And right now our refineries, then we represent 63 of them and over 30,000 workers have a plan to align their refineries with the kind of crudes that are being developed and being extracted now. Those crudes may not have been the same crudes that were extracted 20 or 30 years ago. So that they're, as I said earlier, they're aligning their refineries for, in one year, just 100,000 barrels, just for some of the refineries. So they've got a long-term plan of 8.7 billion. That creates us an opportunity to have a low energy economy, a low cost energy economy, that also helps our refining industry, but in particular also helps our manufacturing with energy intensive industries such as paper, rubber, steel, many of them in your areas. 
So, Mr. Jard, if I could, I just want to start with the jobs question. You represent 30,000 U.S. workers in the oil sector who depend, whose jobs depend on crude oil that's kept within the country. What happens to those jobs if we lift this ban? The uh, largest refiner in America is not BP, it's not Shell, it's not Exxon, it's, it's Valero. Valero is the largest refiner. They're an independent refiner. Many of their refineries would be put at risk if they had to uh, compete with whoever was willing to pay the highest price for that fuel, uh, that uh, crude, I should say. And we all know that who's going to want to pay the highest price is the South Koreans, the Indians, and the, and the Chinese. So what happens to those jobs? They'll be gone. All right. So gas prices is the second question I want to ask about. There's a lot of mixed data about this. Uh, uh, Senator Menendez started here. Some studies, particularly those that have been paid for by the oil industry, suggest that lifting the ban could reduce gas prices. But the Energy Information Administration, which puts out all the official energy data, says that 68% of a customer's cost of gasoline is directly attributable to the refiner's crude oil cost. So if the cost of crude goes up, gas prices, I presume, could go up too. You know, we're not going to settle this question today, but Mr. Gerard, considering how hard Congress is working to try to fund the highway construction bill without raising gas taxes by a single penny and to keep prices at the pump low, does it make sense for us to lift the ban without some contingency plan in place if prices should jump? No, it doesn't make sense. The, the, the study that was just released uh, yesterday by the Crude Coalition shows that uh, People are, in, in some studies, are under uh, under reporting what would happen with the cost of gasoline for automobiles. All right. And in fact, the uh, agency says it would be closer to 13 to 14 cents a gallon. My concern, quite frankly, is I see the gas at the little pump where I not far from. If I see it go up and down every couple of weeks or months. My concern is yes, that's bad, and it's bad for families. And families over a long term are going to lose. Uh, use that, their money, as Senator Donnelly said, for clothes or for, or, or for gasoline in the car. But I'm also concerned about what it does to our industrial manufacturing base. Mr. Gerard, I'm just curious, uh, the, the, the organizations which your, your <coughs> members work for, the, uh, the refineries that they work for, in, in many cases, are, are, do they purchase the oil at, at the, uh, basically the West Texas uh, intermediate price? They don't tell me what price they purchased the oil at, but what they do tell me is one of their problems is not uh, sufficient crude oil, it's the infrastructure to get the crude oil to them. Such as pipelines? Pipelines, rail, whatever the circumstances. Your, your group is in favor of the Trans-Canada Pipeline? Our group is only in favor of the Trans-Canada Pipeline if it's going to use domestically produced pipe. We're not in favor of using Indian pipe that is substandard to what we produce in America, which has been what the plan has been. So until they're prepared to use American-made pipe, we're not in favor. That doesn't mean we're not in favor of pipelines. I hope you get my point. Sure. Here's the conundrum. I'm a strong supporter of American energy independence, of Mr. Ham, your efforts, and Mr. Moncrief, your efforts. Um, and I'm a strong supporter of the refinery workers who are working to try to make a living and trying to feed their families, just like the steel workers in Northwest Indiana do every single day. And I'm a strong supporter of my families who have to make choices between buying a gallon of gas or buying some clothes for their kids. And we've had times where we were awash in oil in Indiana, and my families were paying $4.25 a gallon because of uh, 14 different explanations I received, and uh, every one pointed at the other person. And so um, the question is, I want to have more energy produced. I, I'd be, how do we do this in a way that keeps our refinery workers working? How do we make and both these? Well. How, do we, how do we make sure we keep the refinery workers working too? Well, if we have all this product, it doesn't seem to make much sense to have it go everywhere else but into the American refineries. I think the uh, question that Senator Menendez asked and the point he made is really real. If you're in a so-called open market, the country that's willing to pay the highest price is going to get the energy. And, and the reality is that we need to have low-cost energy in America. We're all for energy expansion. We're all for exporting raw material if that's what we need. For, but our position is America first. Now let me ask one final question. Mr. Gerard, 
Uh, I've seen a couple of refineries, you represent your, your uh, union represents a large number of refineries in the country. I've seen a couple of refineries close in New Jersey losing hundreds of jobs. Uh, isn't it a fact that what we see is a constant re reduction in refinery capacity versus creating the refinery capacity that could ultimately create uh, greater assets here at home? We've, we've, had, uh, we've had a number of refinery closures, as I mentioned earlier, in the last several years. A large part of that was because of their inability to get access to the crude they needed for that refinery. Well, at the same time, we've had other refineries, many of them on the East Coast, who have uh, rearranged their facilities so that they could process the crude more efficiently. And as a result of those refineries, we're now producing the several millions of barrels more per day than we used to. Uh, and the one point I was trying to make with uh, Senator Heikamp is that uh, two things. Uh, we're still importing 47% of our crude for this country from other countries. We're not energy self-sufficient yet. And it, that, that energy self-sufficiency, if we could get it the way you just talked about, that's going to reduce not just 7 or 8 or 10 or 12 cents per gallon for gasoline. That's going to reduce energy costs for energy intensive industries that are in the manufacturing sector like tire and rubber, like paper, like steel, like aluminum, and all those others. So it has a repercussion beyond the highway. And, and the issue of, of uh, oil country tubular goods, uh, part of what really frustrated me is that we file trade cases because of countries that are cheating on their exports of oil country tubular goods to America. We succeed in those cases, and a country like South Korea that doesn't sell one pound of oil country tubular goods in its own market is flooding our markets. So right now in the oil country tubular goods, because they play illegally, India, China, South Korea, and others, our, our domestic share of oil country tubular goods in the last three years has dropped down to 50 percent, which means the oil companies or the, or the people selling the, wanting to buy the drill pipe don't give a damn if it's made in America or not, and as a result of that, we're losing our capacity. So we're not going to be able to uh, have our national security if we can't even generate the pipe that we need for pipelines or for oil country tubular drilling. So to, to answer your question, yes, refineries have closed, but it hasn't been because they're inefficient, it's because they couldn't access the crude they need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.